Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is a bit of a companion piece. I probably should have done this last week, but uh, we had the awesome battle report to put out, so I wanted to get that done sooner rather than later. But this is a companion piece to a video I did on the 18th of June, which, as I'm sure many of you will know, is of course the anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. And that video was five reasons why Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo. And this video is going to be the flip side of that. It's going to be five reasons why the Allies, and that's an important phrase there, won the Battle of Waterloo. Now, many of the comments I got in the, the comment section for the previous video were, uh, were chastising me, telling me off for referring to the Allied Army as the British Army. Because at the Battle of Waterloo, the Army of Wellington was made up of probably about a quarter to a third British. The rest were Dutch Belgians, including quite a lot of militia. And then we get into, of course, the Prussian attack as well. We'll, we'll I have a feeling we will discuss more uh, that more later on. But I just wanted to get out of the way straight away that if I say British, I of course mean the Allied Army. The reason I, that I say British is to make it distinct from the Prussian army. So you've got the Prussians, which was 90-ish percent Prussian. There were some Saxons and stuff like that in there as well. But you've got the other army is the British army. That does include the Dutch Belgians, all that kind of good stuff. If you're someone who's got a real hard-on for the Dutch Belgians, then I apologise in advance, but there you go. This is what we're going with. We're going to try and keep it simple. So, let's get into it. The five reasons why the Allies won the Battle of Waterloo. Well, reason number one is their commanders. The Duke of Wellington is arguably one of the best commanders who's ever lived. Blücher, less so, but we spoke in the, the video. This is why this is the first one, because I think this is the least original one. We spoke in the last video, in the five reasons why Napoleon lost Waterloo. We mentioned in there that the staff system for the Prussians had been developed by people like Scharnhorst, Gneisnau, and was the, what would go on to become early modern staff work. So while Blücher was perhaps not the tactical genius that one might want in this situation, he was more than good enough, and more importantly, he had absolute faith in his staff officers. It was he that pushed Scharnhorst to improve and modernise the the staff and general system and he was obviously very comfortable with using it so on the prussian side while i don't think blucher was a particularly great commander oh, sorry no no i should rephrase that while i don't think blucher was a particularly great tactician he was a very good commander this is a guy who led from the front at the battle of Linny, of course he was the, the first man in the charge of the hussars now this is a guy who's 70 odd He's not necessarily mentally all there. He believed that he would have been made pregnant by an elephant at one point. So he's not necessarily completely lucid all the time. But he's a guy who led a cavalry charge, had his horse shot from underneath him. And then two days later, he's back commanding troops in the field. And that's kind of difficult to argue with. On the British side of things, we've got the Duke of Wellington, the Sepoy General. Now, Wellington famously never lost a battle. And you can sort of point at a couple of skirmishes or, well, you know, this was a strategic loss or whatever. But ultimately, on the battlefield, he was unbeaten. And it wasn't as if he only fought two or three battles. He, he had a pretty good career going on. He'd fought through the peninsula with, crucially, many of the men who would become his divisional and brigade commanders. And, well, and, and core, mainly corps commanders and divisional commanders at Waterloo. I'm thinking of people like General Hill, General Picton, uh, General Ponsonby, two lower divisional commanders, people like General Maitland and General Clinton. So while they may not have had the modern technique of officer selection and training that the Prussians had, and these men, ultimately, they did buy their commissions. They weren't necessarily there on merit. They were probably in the Duke of Wellington's positions on merit due to their experience in the Peninsula War. These were men that he was familiar fighting with and that he knew their abilities. Now, the troops under his command, this is something that I said maybe a little bit over-exuberantly in the first video. The troops under his command, I said, were probably the best British army because they contained a lot of Peninsula War veterans. As a lot of people mentioned in the comments, not all of the veterans were there. Some of them had gone to America. Some of them had gone back home. And their place had been filled by 
troops who were perhaps not quite as good troops like Dutch militia, for instance. Now, you can argue about whether the Dutch militia were good or not good, but they certainly weren't as good as battle-hardened Peninsula veterans. So, you know, Wellington had the right people in the right places, and Blücher had the same thing, but for different reasons. For Wellington, it was due to his experience, uh, sorry, he and his general's experience. For Blücher, it was the nascent officer training and you know the, the way that they'd restructured their army. If you want to know more about that, I've done a, a four or five part series on the Prussian army. I'd definitely check that out. Speaking of the quality of the troops, we're going to have that as our second point. Now, again, this is a bit of an interesting one. The Army of the North in the Napoleon video, I said, wasn't actually all that it was cracked up to be. And I maintain, I don't actually think the Army of the North was that good an army, particularly in the annals of French armies across history and even in the French Napoleonic armies. I really don't think it was up there. It was nowhere near the quality of the 1805 maybe even 18, well, certainly 1806, 7, 8, nowhere near there. Probably not even the quality of the 1812 army. But, you know, the retreat from Moscow would cause huge casualties in both the men and the officer corps. So I don't think they were a great opponent, which helps you, you beat them. But on top of that, you had the quality of the English, oh, well, the Allied, sorry, and the Prussian troops. So let's start with the Prussians, because they're probably the easiest one. Now, they had done quite a lot of hard fighting in Europe throughout 1813 and 14. they had also occupied Paris for a while as well. Although the army had been leavened by a number of troops from previous German states, some of whom were allied and still actively loyal to Napoleon. The Saxons spring to mind there. But they were effectively formed into the new corps, the new uh, Prussian corps system, and they were effectively integrated in with the Prussian units. That's something that the Duke of Wellington also excelled in. Most foreign armies, so uh, again, I'm going to use the French as an example here, particularly in 1812, because they had a lot of foreign contingents there, would separate out the French troops from the foreign troops. This is something that happened right through to 1914. You had the Metropolitan Units and you had the Cosmopolitan Units. And that, that's where those two phrases come from. And they would do that. So, for instance, the I think it was the Ninth Corps was the, in quotes, Foreign Corps. So there you would have the Italian troops. You'd have the Bavarians, the Württembergers, the uh, Hesse Darmstadt's. All of those Confederation troops would be in their own separate corps. You had a core of the Duchy of Warsaw. They were their own troops. They weren't integrated in with French troops. Now, something that the Duke of Wellington did in the peninsula was he had a brigade of Portuguese alongside his British troops. So to take, for an example, the 3rd Division, my favourite division, they had two brigades of British troops, and then they had Colonel Manly Power, brilliant name, they had his Portuguese brigade. So you'd have three brigades in that division, two British and one Portuguese. And this was something that the Duke of Wellington maintained in 1815. If we take, for example, the uh, the, first the first division, the Guards Division, you had two brigades of foot guard. You had the Coldstreams and the 1st Guard Regiment. And you also had some artillery as well. Then you had a Hanoverian Brigade that contained uh, three or four regiments, I can't remember off the top of my head, three or four battalions of Hanoverian Landwehr, so militia, and also four regiments of KGL as well. So, I mean, that was, that was a particularly large division, to be fair. But that's an example of how even the guards had foreign troops in with them. The old guard uh, brigade for Napoleon would never have had foreign troops in. For a while, he had the Dutch Grenadiers in there, but as soon as possible, he got rid of those as well. So I guess this point's rather morphed from the quality of the troops they had available to being, and I think this is probably a more prescient point, to a better integration of the different qualities of troops they had available to them. If you've got a brigade, or sorry, a division that's made up of two British brigades and a Hanoverian brigade, then it's a little bit like having a reinforced concrete. It's the steel rod that goes through to strengthen the concrete of the Hanoverian militia. Interestingly, Napoleon did this in what's probably his greatest victory, Austerlitz, 
That's how he used the old guard, but he didn't really use them again like that until maybe Hanau uh, was the last time. That was in 1813. But by integrating these troops, both the British and the Prussians had their whole army as being effective fighting forces rather than having you know, one, uh, sorry, one division that's got all your good stuff in and then the rest of them are, are pretty trashed here. Now, third, this is going to be an interesting one. Now, this is going to be one that I think is going to be a little little controversial maybe when you hear about it straight away but stick with me i'm hoping to win you around by my arguments and that is the allies by which i mean the british and the prussians had a much better i want to use the phrase esprit de corps which <laughs> ironically but that's not really what i mean they had a better i'm going to say sense of purpose than the french had napoleon's lethargy i talked about in the last video he didn't really get much done after the victory at Linny. And I feel, looking on it today, you know, through the, the mists of 200 years, there's almost an expectation of failure from Napoleon. It's almost like he's bet everything on red and he's won. He came back from Elba and, you know, he's re re gone back to the throne, all that stuff. And he was still begging for peace, but it wasn't given to him. And I, I have, I feel, and I can't really back this up, that they... They had a, a sense that this was the, the final hurrah. This was the death ride they were going out. I mentioned in a previous video that Davout had been left behind to guard Paris. Arguably Napoleon's greatest um, marshal. Uh, I, I think that's arguable, but it, it, the fact that you can even argue it means that he's up there. And he left him behind in Paris, presumably to defend it in the case of an attack. Paris had been attacked in 1814. There was the Battle of Montmartre. So there was a very real possibility that there would be fighting in the city itself. Shows to me that to an extent, Napoleon was planning to fail. It's got a very sort of Russian poetry melancholy about it. And this is something that the British and the Prussians didn't have. They were expecting to win. Now, obviously, Napoleon stole his march. He humbugged Wellington. But even from then, I think the, the fact that the Prussians got defeated at Linny... The British got defeated at Quatre Bras, you could argue, and then they both fell back to still be mutually supporting each other. One thing that's not really talked about is the fact that on the... So the Quatre Bras and Linny took place on the 16th of June, two days before the Battle of Waterloo. Not I've, I've read, but I've not heard it talked about a lot, that on the 17th of June, the following day, Napoleon... Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Wellington and Blücher actually met each other Wellington rode over to Blücher, obviously recovering from his injuries, and they met face to face. Blücher promised that he wouldn't fall back away from the British, and then that pact was made. They were clearly confident that together they could beat Napoleon, and so it turned out to be. So I think there's almost an aspect of them willing it to, to happen. They willed the victory, whereas I get the feeling that Napoleon and his marshals, particularly someone like Ney, almost just wanted to see how long this could go for before they were defeated they wanted to you know, they, they were like um as an as, as a rather rather trite example i was watching wimbledon yesterday and england's number one was getting absolutely thrashed the england's female number one was getting just absolutely annihilated and from probably the second game in the second set she was playing not to embarrass herself that's that's kind of how I see Napoleon and the Army of the North. They were having one last hurrah to show that they weren't punks. They'd already been beaten, but they were determined to show that they could um, could you know still still show the business. And this is evident that it went down to the lower ranked troopers as well. You can see it in things like the uh, the memoirs of Captain Mercer and people like this. N never once do they consider the possibility they could be defeated. Troops like the Household Cavalry, they were clearly, they'd missed most of the Peninsula War. They got there just in time for Vittoria, but they also had something to prove. I think it's something that makes the Hundred Days so fascinating is the tragedy of it. It's the fact that it's this, not even a wounded animal lashing out before it's killed. It's not, not even that much. It's more of a. It, it, it's very British, actually. <laughs> it's. It's. I, I'm. I'm trying. I'm trying to to explain it. Really, I'm finding it difficult, as you can almost certainly tell. 
but it's the going down in a blaze of glory. It's better to burn out than fade away and things like that. So I think there's there's that morale factor to it as well. And it's not necessarily battlefield morale, but it's more if you're going to talk about things on a strategic level. So there's two levels. There's tactical, that's on the battlefield. And there's strategic, that's on the campaign map. And I think there was a strategic lack of faith in the ability to win. Of course, had the British and the Prussians been defeated, then the Austrians and the Russians were waiting in the wings to swoop in. So realistically, I don't believe there was any chance of victory for the French. And that, uh, again, moves on quite nicely to our fourth reason, and that is they had a clear objective. The Allies had a goal. It was the defeat of Napoleon and the reinstitution of the monarchy, Louis XVIII. What really was Napoleon's goal? Now, this doesn't really go into the tactical aspects of the Battle of Waterloo, but it very much feeds into the strategic aspects, and that's something that Napoleon couldn't ignore, something that perhaps Wellington and Blücher had the luxury of doing. So maybe that's point, point four, point five, is that Napoleon had a lot more to worry about than either Wellington or Blücher, who could just focus on defeating the returning the monster but their goal during the Hundred Days campaign, or what you know became known as the Hundred Days campaign, was to defeat Napoleon and destroy his army. That's all. Like, that's all they had to do. Napoleon had to try and force the Prussians back. He had to force the British back to want to evacuate, and then he had to try and make peace with the Tsar and the the Emperor of Austria. And I have to say, I'm not entirely certain how how he could even have potentially done that. The Congress of Vienna which was going on, that was the um, the meeting where they were basically going to carve up Europe. Actually, the British and the French were co were coalescing to form a power block against the Russians and the Prussians. So the Austrians were maybe, maybe still in play. Napoleon may have got some joy from making a peace with them, but the Russians were still very much in the picture. And, uh, and you know, even, even had he beaten the British and the Prussians, he still would have had the might of Russia to deal with. So this kind of leads in from point three, which was, you know, I, I feel that they all knew that this was a doomed endeavor from the start, but they he didn't have a clear goal. His clear goal was, I'm going to... It, it, he was he was like a, a gambler playing blackjack. So the, the idea in blackjack is to get as close to 21 as possible, and you keep asking for another card, and you get closer and closer and closer. And that's kind of what Napoleon was doing. When he landed, then he took the gamble there. Give me another card. Then he marched on Paris. Give me another card. Then he raised the, the army. Give me another card. Then he marched to Brussels. Give me another card. And finally, he got over 21. He went bust. It was every gamble that paid off led to another gamble. The Allies didn't have to do this. They had to win once. They had to, one of Napoleon's gambles, not pay off. And they were going to win. And that's exactly what happened at Waterloo. They had a clear strategy that they needed to follow. They needed to defeat. Napoleon, that was it. And there's a maxim. It might be in Serve to Lead. I'm not sure. It might be in the uh, like the, the army officer's handbook. But there's a maxim that says clarity of thought is clarity of action. And I think that's something that Napoleon didn't have. Partially due to his illness as well. But because he had so much to worry about that he couldn't concentrate on the simple goal of defeat the enemy in the field. That's all Napoleon. That's all, sorry, Wellington and Blücher had to think on. And finally, point number five is it's a bit of a twofer this one as well is the ground that the allies picked and that they had the chance to pick the ground i mentioned before in the napoleon video about how lethargic he was after the battle of Ligny. It allowed the british plenty of time to get on to mont saint jean the ridge at mont saint jean and fight a defensive battle in the way that wellington not only preferred but excelled at one of wellington's early battles the battle of assai was not, I mean he was a victory but it was not one of his best victories that's because he was had to be the aggressor on that occasion now Wellington could be aggressive as well the battle of Salamanca was an attack by the British but he was much more comfortable defending I hear he fights this battle sat on his ass but we'll have to kick him off it as Napoleon said in exactly that accent as far as I'm concerned off to Napoleon's right was the village well sort of back right was the village of Placenoir that not only allowed the prussians to attack but it it 
sort of screened them from being defended off by the French as well. The fact that the two armies could combine, also a huge problem for Napoleon. Both armies combined actually outnumbered Napoleon. Although if you include Grouchy's troops and the troops that fought uh, their, their separate battle on the 18th of June, uh, that, it's, it's variable. But either way, they were roughly evenly matched and one of the armies is coming on from the side. If you're ever wargaming and you have equal points or equal units and one of them's attacking in an L shape and the other one isn't, well, the one that isn't is going to be in a whole load of trouble. So by being able to pick Mont-Saint-Jean for his defensive position, not only was that great for Wellington, he could hide his troops behind the reverse slope. The, the corn, weirdly, when I went to the 200th, uh, reenactment you know 200 year reenactment the corn then was quite high and a red coat lying down in it he almost completely disappears it, it was a the craziest thing you think oh yeah you'll still be able to see him absolutely not and back then the corn would have been a lot higher as well because it's subsequently been like, bred out not genetically modified but uh, you know gene can well you know what i mean it's been specifically bred to be shorter so anyway there's a bit of a, uh, if there's absolutely positively one thing I know nothing about, it's agriculture. So, <laughs> so there you go, that and horses. So, uh, by being able to pick his defensive, his defensive territory, Wellington was able to play to his strengths. Now, Napoleon was an aggressive general, so that kind of made him play to his strengths as well. But I think, as we've spoken, there are many, many reasons why the Duke of Wellington, he was at the, in the maximum of his strengths. And Napoleon was quite a long way from them. So those are my five reasons why the Allies won the Battle of Waterloo, as distinct to the five reasons why Napoleon lost. So the first one was the quality of the Allied commanders. The second one was the quality of the Allied troops. And more importantly, the excellent integration of the Allied troops, which meant there was no obvious weak spot for the French to attack. The third reason is that there was no real belief in the French army that they could win, whereas there was not really a belief in the Allied army that they could lose. This is, it, it's not really quantifiable on the tabletop. I guess you could do something like the French brigades count as broken if they are at half strength, whereas the Allied ones only count as broken if they're over half, so, you know, if they're under half strength. Something like that could, could be quite an interesting rule. But the third a reason why I believe the Allies won the Battle of Waterloo is that they just wanted it more. They had more belief. Point number four is similar to that one. It's that the French had no real clear goals, whereas the Allies did. The Allies had to beat Napoleon in the field, destroy his ability to wage war, drive him to the peace table. That's all they needed to do. Napoleon, on the other hand, he had a lot more stuff on his mind. He couldn't just concentrate on the, uh, the, the task that was in front of him. The Allied generals, however, absolutely could. And finally, fifth, and I think probably the most important one, the ground was of Wellington's choosing. Napoleon, despite humbugging uh, Wellington, eventually would slow down and allow the Duke to pick his own battlefield. An absolutely horrendous mistake. And I think that was the one that really cost the French the battle because it allowed the Prussians to flank them and it allowed the British to fight in a way that suited both Wellington his troops, and the way he was used to conducting battles. So that's it. Those are my five reasons why the Allies won the Battle of Waterloo. Let me know in the comments your ideas, if you think I'm right, if you think I'm wrong, if you think there's something I missed, because I absolutely guarantee there's something I've missed. But please let me know in the comments down below. This The last video was really, really interesting. There were some great comments made. A lot of people disagreeing with me, and those were the best ones. Obviously, the ones who do it respectfully, and I think they were all pretty respectful, so I thank you for that. And let me know in the comments where you think I've missed out, what you think I've got wrong, and if you think there were other reasons, perhaps even more important reasons, why the Allies won the Battle of Waterloo. There's going to be no video next week. I am at a Warhammer tournament, so there'll be no video next Sunday. Just a quick reminder... We are now doing back to live stream Wednesdays, so join us at 6 o'clock British Summer Time. We are currently painting up the Irish Regiment. So uh, we've just finished the Württemberg Garde Corps. I'm looking at them now. They need basing. I forgot to buy some flock yesterday when I was at the hobby shop. <laughs> that was a mistake. 
Uh, but they need uh, finishing off, then they're done. But we've got the Irish that we're working on at the moment. So join us for that. That is 6 o'clock British summertime every Wednesday. There'll be no video next Sunday because I am away. But I just want to say thank you so much for watching, particularly if you're watching to the end like this. I also want to say as well, and it's something that I don't do often enough, I want to thank the channel members. There is a way you can help support the channel. That is by pressing the join button down below. I've done this at the end of the video because it's, uh, I don't know, it's not something, I, I don't like it when other YouTubers do it. But I want to have a shout out to those who have supported me. So that's Nate, Rob, Rusty, Fiegel2909, The Demon, WTTNC Frep, Natural Born Marmot, Rusty. And special thanks go to our newest member, Rob Wright. And super special thanks go to Christopher Horner. So thank you very much, guys, for watching and supporting the channel. And I'll see you guys not next uh, Sunday because I'm not here. So I'll either see you in the live stream on Wednesday or I'll see you in a fortnight's time. Thank you very much. Goodbye.